Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's Sunday morning. It's um, sometime in December. I've now immediately forgotten the date in December. And Lizzie and I are together again, as we have been. This is uh, week number 10 of this project. So which I know that 10 is only a, a significant number to us because we have 10 fingers and 10 toes. But um, it seemed very significant to me that we've been doing this long enough now to be able to be in double digits. And um, here we are still, it seems to me, deep in an important conversation, at least one which seems to be mattering a lot to both of us. And from hearing from so many of you who are watching <clears throat> and listening in various times, somebody was telling me last week um, that he'd managed to figure out how to download this and listen to, this on the, listen to us on the underground in London, which I thought was rather fabulous. Um, so we're really delighted to be doing this this morning. And um, we have chosen uh, this, uh, another poem as our seed for this morning's conversation, which is um, The World Has Need of You by Ellen Bass. And I'm sure we'll both say some more about this once we get going, but Lizzie, I'm so pleased you're here and you might want to say things before we start. I just want to say good morning and I'm really glad as every week to, as we switch on the video and get together, a kind of gladness descends on me that we're doing this. And I feel really blessed to be in the curiousness of what might emerge because I think it, probably goes without saying but we don't plan what we're going to say or anything and or work out themes or anything before we begin so it feels like our like when we sign on that I'm kind of on the edge of something being created a conversation being created and I feel really invited and grateful for that I think uh, what you're saying, Lizzie, is this is a poem that I chose for this week. And what you're saying is so resonant for me with why I chose this poem, but also um, why we're doing this project at all, which is um, also a lot to do with why Third Space exists, which I think is something to do with the enormous uh, possibility for contribution that human beings have. Mm. And it seems so obvious to me that the intent behind doing this series of conversations every Sunday morning is to be a contribution, is to make a contribution to others. And so often our contribution comes when we let go sufficiently to allow <clears throat> who and what we are to come through. And, and um, the more we're able to let go, the more of our um, goodness, and love and responsibility and um, courage and compassion and fierceness and whatever it is can come through us. And that that's a huge part of what it is to be a human being is to um, be a, maybe one way of saying it is being like a, a conduit for something, for life. So I know you and I have been talking so much about what this is that we're doing and we talk before we start and we talk after we end and we talk during the week about um, this project and this way of doing it where we're um, bringing a seed and it turns into something in the midst of conversation because of whoever we are on the morning of the conversation, mm. it seems to me is an expression of this and it's a way of practicing, at least for me, it's becoming a way of practicing exactly what Ellen Bass is going to point to in her poem, which is um, the world really needs us. It needs all of us. Mm. And it doesn't always need us in the most obvious of ways. It's really easy to think that the world needs us because each of us has to somehow be the world's savior or something, which I think is a, a bit of a trap. I'm going to be the one who deals with all of the political difficulties and all of the social difficulties and all the environmental difficulties. It seems to me that yes, we can dedicate ourselves to that and that matters. But in a way, what also matters is something so much more simple, which is um, could be said in the simple way as showing up. Mm. 
So I'm thinking that that's what we're trying to practice as well on a Sunday morning is showing up and seeing um, what kind of aliveness and what kind of creativity and contribution that can bring. Yeah. And Justin, so lovely that you're saying that because I've, as you're talking, I'm realizing that really this project is also about the continuation of us learning forever to be ourselves. And maybe learning to be oneself involves this thing of contributing in the moment and seeing what wants to be born and how that can be aligned with the nature of what it is to be a human being. And, and certainly that's my experience is learning to trust more and more by encountering sources and trusting them to bring out me. And maybe that's what poetry is for and what writing is for and what literature is for and what teaching is for, is we're all learning how to be ourselves. And this particular way of encountering a source, encountering a, an articulation of some kind is the kind of the little um, pinprick that has something of us emerge. Mm. And then if anybody encounters us doing this thing, maybe it's like another rippling of the pinprick that has more emerge of other people too. And that those things aren't separate from one another, which is how come our contributions are so important because we're all not separate. And our connection means that we pass this on always. I've got a pyjama husband. Yes, I, I could hear you had, um, you had guests in the room. And I'm sure he would have been on the screen, but he's got his lovely stripy pyjamas on, his hair's all over the place, and he's bringing me a cup of tea and a water, telling me to be quiet. Yeah. <laughs> Not telling me, really. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. <laughs> the very lovely thing about this, Lizzie, is um, nobody, of course, can prove that he exists. You may, we could imagine that you're just imagining him. I know he exists, really. I could prove it. You but... could prove it, but you're not going to. <laughs> so, um, should we read this poem and see where it, yeah. where it goes? Um, I have one more thing to say before maybe I'll read it first. Mm. That's coming to me from our conversation, which is um, one of the things I know about myself is that I have the kind of orientation to the world where I very often think I ought to know about things before I do them and I think that uh, learning and knowing about things is really really important and we wouldn't so much in the world wouldn't be here if we weren't dedicated to that and at the same time it's an enormous trap because I often think that the world only needs me when I know stuff and then the more I find out how little I know how little I understand I was thinking about this yesterday I was sitting with my family and feeling into um there's so little i understand about what's really happening here mm -hmm. like right here and also how come we're here and what's this whole vast life that we're all living in in the middle of that stretches way back in time and way forward into the future and all of those things i really don't understand it and that can be paralyzing it's really easy for that to be paralyzing for me and that's why i'm so grateful for ellen bass so I'm going to read this. It's called The World Has Need of You by Ellen Bass. And she starts with a quote from um, one of my other favorite poets, uh, Reina Maria Rilke. And I don't know what poem this comes from. He says, everything here seems to need us. And here's her poem. I can hardly imagine it. As I walk to the lighthouse, feeling the ancient prayer of my arms swinging in counterpoint to my feet. Here I am, suspended between the sidewalk and twilight, the sky dimming so fast it seems alive. What if you felt the invisible tug between you and everything? 
A boy on a bicycle rides by, his wide shirt, his white shirt open, flaring behind him like wings. It's a hard time to be human. We know too much and too little. Does the breeze need us? The cliffs? The gulls? If you've managed to do one good thing, the ocean doesn't care. But when Newton's apple fell toward the earth, the earth, ever so slightly, fell toward the apple as well. The world has need of you by Ellen Bass. Everything here seems to need us. I can hardly imagine it as I walk to the lighthouse, feeling the ancient prayer of my arms swinging in counterpoint to my feet. Here I am, suspended between the sidewalk and twilight, the sky dimming so fast it seems alive. What if you felt the invisible tug between you and everything? A boy on a bicycle rides by, his white shirt open, flaring behind him like wings. It's a hard time to be human. We know too much and too little. Does the, breed need, does the breeze need us? The cliffs, the gulls? If you've managed to do one good thing, the ocean doesn't care. When Newton's apple fell toward the earth, the earth ever so slightly fell toward the apple as well. Well, what strikes you to say about this or in response to this? So, funnily enough, I'm feeling this this faith feeling of every move we make in our development, every process we're a part of in our inner world, every difficulty we encounter, that there is a faith that the world will be in response like an outbreath is to an inbreath. And when Ellen says how Newton's apple fell toward the earth and the earth fell ever so slightly toward the apple, it feels to me that this poem is partly about how the world meets us, how we are part of the world. And the fact that the, the Rilke line of everything here seems to need us. So there's all these ways and themes that she's inviting us to be a part of the world, to experience ourselves as being part of the world and feeling this invisible tug between us and everything and knowing that we're not separate and therefore our individual lives are an intrinsic part of the whole. And our shifting and our changing and our staying the same <coughs> is not separate. And so the world, the world responds. And You know, even this morning, I was having some big feelings about some stuff, and in a way, this is respond. This is the world is this right now responding. And there's been there have been a few comments as well in our group, Justin, of the timing of the sources that we bring, and people saying to me, I met the lady on Tuesday, and she said, "My goodness." You've no idea the things that you're saying are so well timed for my life. And so this kind of interconnection, this web is so intricate and we are part of that by doing this. And we're part of that by living the lives we're living and being in the process that we're in, giving the grief that we're feeling or the being frightened or 
feeling inadequate or whatever whatever's happening there is a way that the world is responding if we if we look if we feel it's very <clears throat> moving for me as you say a lot of all of this and having the poem here because i think one of the things I'm getting reminded of already in our conversation is that we matter. So this is one of the things I know is really, really easy for me to forget. I, I, I woke up into this this morning having had all kinds of troubling dreams and um, it's very easy for me to wake up in the morning feeling very small and feeling the, the vastness of the world. And that somehow I somehow I um, I can't get a purchase, but and to have a purchase would mean somehow having it's a very sort of um, childlike notion. Somehow I'd have the whole world in my hands, and then I would know that I mattered and that there was something for me to do. So in what you're saying, and in what Ellen Bass is saying, there's also for me this very um, necessary and dignified and beautiful recognition that we matter even in ways that may seem to us to be really tiny. So it is actually the case that in a minuscule way when an apple falls towards the earth, the earth falls towards, falls towards the apple. It's just that the sizes of them are so vastly different that you, you, it would be almost impossible to measure the movement of the earth towards the apple. But when um, when I feel into the poem, so knowing that my life matters and that our life matters when, for example, snowing here this morning, which is so beautiful, when we open the door and walk out into the snow and feel whatever it is that we feel and see whatever it is we see from being in the snow, that matters. Our response to the snow matters. And it matters in all kinds of ways. It matters in, you know, maybe in the obvious ways, like I might have a conversation with my daughter, Maya, about the snow. We've been having this conversation already and we might go out into the snow and play in the snow and that will matter in both of our lives. And then who knows how that will matter in the way that she or I then touch the lives of other people. Even for, for example, talking about it now, you know, I was really starting to feel the way that something apparently very small, like noticing the snow, which in one way of looking you could say is inconsequential. As, as, I, as we talk about this and as I'm feeling into this, it, one of the things it does is it, um, I'm going to use a word that came to me in our conversation last week. I don't think I've said here, but it reminds us of our holiness. I don't mean that in, in the context of any particular religious tradition. I mean, I mean the sanctity that comes from being alive and being human and being able to pay attention. Mm. And when we pay attention, the world also responds. It affects the world. Mm. Which is one of the things that artists do. Things I love about art is it seems to me that you could take a very sort of utilitarian approach to the world and you could look at what artists do and you could say, well, that doesn't do anything. It doesn't build something and it doesn't sell something and it doesn't, but an artist seeing something, feeling something and expressing something does change the world. The world responds to it and it changes the world even in what looks like the teeniest way is part of a great, flow of um, significance and we can only orient to the world when we're prepared to do what she says which is to uh, feel the invisible tug between us and everything also has me feel just in the the kind of benevolence that our world is, is that it is always ready to be in response to us. It, I mean, in fact, it is always responding. 
and as you're saying we either get to pay attention or not or somewhere in between and this poem feels to me like an articulation of a moment that Ellen was walking along and these things happened and they got made into a writing down of an experience that captured this huge inquiry and that you being in the snow with Maya or me receiving a cup of tea and water from Matthew or us waking up with a feeling of terror like any of those moments has within it however many poems might be and I'm feeling invited into the kind of contact with myself and the moment that gives birth to noticing and being attentive to life that we might allow ourselves to experience the response of the world rather than crashing through it and getting things done and being busy and uh, achieving what needs to be achieved today or something and of course those things are in their ways important and many times they're so at the expense of this noticing and this life-giving uh, antidote to feeling frightened and fearful all the time and I'm noticing in my experience now you know I, I also had weird dreams last night and woke up in this weird state of being really confused like my yeah my world had been kind of shaken around by all these things really anxious things that were happening that I can't even you know with dreams the words like don't actually exist because it was so weird that there's no language for it it was like that kind of scenario and um I notice it threw me into this big feeling of being really frightened and anxious and not knowing what the hell a life was for and what, you know, how are we can do anything. We, we can't do what we need to do. We're, we don't have what we need. You know, really fearful thoughts. And who knows whether those things will ever like go away or not. It seems to me that however much we grow, we encounter the opposite of our joy and the opposite of our fear in equal measure somehow. So it's not like I am seeking to get rid of those things. But the encounters that we have with these sources and our own sources and our own writing and our own development feel like they widen my perspective from the habitual fearfulness or anxiety or inadequacy or self-doubt. They feel very narrow and very defined and very like I can pin something on them. And then in order to feel more than that and not just be driven by that, these sources of inspiration and breathing life into a life, rather than having like a suffocated small life filled with wanting to control or fix or make things better, or have things turn out the way that I think they should or something, that these conversations and these inquiries in our big lives um, it draws us into far more breath filled space where there's so much more possibility available and that's how I'm feeling right now it's like that fear is still there I'm still with that feeling of anxiety I still know the questions I'm asking myself and there's more there's more spaciousness there's more lightness there's more breath and that feels like a big contribution that we can make to one another to create the spaciousness around whatever difficulty we're having at any time and not to fix the difficulty or make it go away but to breathe life around it so that it can have its place like the apple relative to the world we think those things are everything and maybe they're an apple to the world rather than the world itself that we are
very <clears throat> struck in what you're saying about the um, necessity of paying attention, which I think is is also so um, deeply in, embedded in this poem. When when we pay attention to there's such a beautiful line: the ancient prayer of my arms swinging in counterpoint to my feet. Something apparently so ordinary and inconsequential as our arms swinging as we walk along is actually an ancient prayer. It's been with us since the first of our ancestors were upright. So it's not something tiny, it's actually an expression of a billion of years and a great inexplicable something that works through all of history and all of time that has us. Uh, be here mm. so when we can pay attention to that and to the sky dimming so fast it feels alive and to the boy riding past on the bicycle with his shirt flaring in the wind um like you're saying a couple of things happen so one is sometimes we find out that the troubles that we're carrying that seem like they are the world are part of a much vaster world and that is a helpful thing to remember but the other part of it that I so appreciate and what you said, Lizzie, was it can open us from, from a, when we're holding on so tight to just this that's here and the particular something that I'm meant to do or solve or know, um, the world can feel impossibly small. Mm -hmm. And um, so many poets are reminding us of this, that the act of paying attention to life, to what's apparently mundane is also the act of allowing ourselves to be in life is the act of noticing the way in which we're touched and supported by all of these things but also how our presence in them matters and one way in which our presence matters sometimes is just that we see things mm. like i remember reading an amazing article which was um attempting to undo so I think what you were talking about also, Lizzie, my sense of it was that you were talking about what happens when we feel separate from life, when we feel separate from the world, which is so easy for us to feel and which we're taught all the time that we're separate. It's in our education system, it's in our media, it's in that we're, we're not part of all of this. So this article was so beautiful and brilliant because it was pointing out that if you walk in a forest and you see a tree, mm. one way that you can say this is you can say, well, there's a tree and there's my image, there's an image of the tree in my mind because I'm separate from the tree. And so it's my representation of the tree. Mm -hmm. But the author of the article was pointing out something that's also in this Alan Bass poem, which is um, there's also a very real way in which an aspect of the tree is present in your mind. Something of the tree that could not be, would not be in the world were it not for the fact that it was you who were seeing the tree in the way that you were seeing it. Mm. It's a... Uh, it's an expression of the tree. It's, um, it's a, uh, like I said, it's an aspect of the tree. Mm. This was really revolutionary for me to see this, which is that even when I'm most separate, the way I'm seeing the world is an expression of the world. Mm. So the world interpen interpenetrates us all the time. Yeah. I think I'm saying all of this because I know I need it. Yeah. I know I need to remember this every time I forget this and I feel outside the world mostly I'm I'm lost those are the times when I'm least able to muster any kind of contribution to anything or anyone yeah and that's what I mean about it it breeds life I mean I literally feel these poems and our conversations and our community and our inquiries breathing life into me in, in places where it really does feel like a dead end. You know, and I know in our work, Justin, there's a way that we articulate this as well in that when we feel confounded or confused or at this dead end that we're talking about, which of course we're in many, many times, that feels like the gold you know that feels like gold because we know that this is possible 
we know we can do this again and again and again, which is we can breathe life into our difficulties when we get stuck. Like stuckness is the way that we know to reach out for support. Stuckness is the point that we seek for the, the resources that we know about. Stuckness is the way that we know something else needs to happen other than this stuckness. That, that there's, a, there's an impetus that we practice and that we learn, which is cultural, i.e. most of us get told to hunker down and get on with it, stop crying, pull ourselves together and all those kind of cliched thingies. And this counterculture says, when I'm stuck, ask for help. When I'm confounded and confused, reach out for support or resource or read a book or watch a podcast or do, uh, listen to a podcast or watch a video or call a friend or be go to a workshop or seek therapy or and this is what feels like the beauty of our contribution is that this feels like we are being that for ourselves by doing this and it helps us to be in this for sure and that we build the counterculture by being an offering of this particular kind. Feels like how we breathe life into the world. And our work feels like a stand for that. You know, stuckness, confusedness, difficulty, confound, being confounded, not knowing what to do. They're not being a solution. Like that's the gate, they're the gateways. And if you don't know that they're a gateway, it feels like you're royally done or ruined. And so that ruining is the opening. And that so much more is possible than just being stuck where we are with our fearful, small, um, really, really diminished or defended or confused places. So that's a wonderful list, inspiring list that you made. And I want to add to it when we're stuck, pay attention. Mm. Maybe that's just the thing that I'm, I keep on learning is when I'm stuck and afraid, the easiest thing for me to do is to imagine the opposite of, um, what Ellen Bass is saying is to is say I'm lost, to imagine I'm lost from the world. So all of the moves that you're talking about are ways of being in contact. And another way of contact, being in contact is to pay attention, is to really look yeah. and feel um, the swing of our arms and the boy on the bike and the cliffs and the girls and the lighthouse and also the way that the earth ever so slightly falls towards us. Mm. And I think it also depends on our, I think we all have habitual ways of like dealing with things too. And lots of us stay alone when we should be in contact with others. And other people go outside of ourselves when we should probably stay with ourselves a little bit longer. And I think it's all about our own contact with ourselves to know what would really really help and make experiments with that too i know that i can sit and think that i'm thinking about something and actually i'm just neurosing about it i can i can think i'm paying attention and actually i'm just making the whole thing this massive soup of self-analysis that actually makes takes me further down the dark hole which i may need to go down and then other times i feel like i'm reaching for help and actually i'm also adding drama to it as well you know, that thing you said last week about being in denial about the thing is kind of a really, really bad bit because you, you're not actually onto it. And I think um, that's how tricky our personalities can get. And I think, as you say, we're all, we all have different ways that we feel helped. And our culture is also very oriented towards dealing with stuff on our own. And so 
the fact that we're together now, but we're in community and that community gets so little promotion in our general society feels like I don't think you can go wrong with community actually in, in a way there's, there's something about this that feels really precious because somehow being witness to one another's process being witness to one another's stuff has got this beautiful kind of de-shaming quality about it as well and for us to be paying attention in community and being with one another in whatever difficulties we're in that feels to me like when i start when i'm talking about it i don't know what else there is to do i really don't know what else there is to do that that could be more valuable more important and of course there's hundreds of things that are important but i'm saying for me that feels like my path We've gone way over our complete time, which is, I think, is just fine. And it, it's such a, it's a great point. I think the busy um, place for us to end is with this declaration of dedication to community that you're talking about. Mm. And I'm so with you. And I, I know that um, in as much as, as what we're doing is an expression of what we're up to more widely in third space, this commitment to making community in a world where community has been taken from us um, seems very central I, I think community has been taken from us for all kinds of reasons it's no accident that we end up at this time in history with so many people feeling bereft of community when it's actually what we most need as human beings and we try to make it in all kinds of shallow ways we think we're in community because we buy the same products or we watch the same tv programs or whatever it is, and that we've got really serious about making community in more enduring ways and in more meaningful ways as a response to all of this. So um, I just want to say before we end, we, we talked about this before, Lizzie, that I'm going to mention if, if you're um, watching this or listening to this in and around December 2017 and you're not coming to this months and months later, um, one of the things that we we do in third space to make community is um through the coaching programs that we run which may look like they're just about um learning how to be of support to the development of others as well as to ourselves but they are also very in a very um profound way and uh, intentional way a way of building community both communities that last for a short period of time and communities that stretch over a long time so we have one of them coming up um, on the 15th and 16th of January 2018 in London. Um, we are going to be running our two-day coaching to excellence program, which is a foundation program in um, integral coaching. <clears throat> and I will be there for sure um, teaching that program. And who knows, maybe some other wonderful third space people will be present. So we wanted to let you know about it. And if you're interested, you can um, contact us through the Facebook group, or you can just go to the thirdspacecoaching.com website where all the details are listed. And we would love to see you there. And I think we should end for today. This has been really gorgeous. I'm so grateful again for this kind of centering feeling and be in contact with this poem and this conversation being born I feel very as always invited into the more than more than my last night's dream making me feel anxious and mm. the questions that I'm in which I'm still in but I feel more than that so I'm really grateful for that mm. yeah me too <clears throat> I'm glad we do this and I'm I'm feeling so grateful to all of you who are watching and listening and um, setting aside time to do that with us. Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> if the world keeps on turning in roughly the way that it has been, we're going to be here again next Sunday morning with something else. And we will so look forward to seeing you. Bye, everyone. Bye.